1 John chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 this morning, John is uh, summing up his, uh, his argument, his case, what he's been uh, walking us through, brotherly love, and how that leads to the assurance of the believer to know the love of Christ, you know. He's going to sum that up and even take us a step deeper than that. It says in verse uh, 16 and 17, it says, Matter of fact, I'm going to start in verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because he is because as he is, so are we in the world. So, um, verse 17, it says, and we. It's interesting. Paul, excuse me, John drags you into his thoughts. It's not just us apostles. It's not just us who walked with Jesus and saw him. You know, it's, it's all believers. It's all Christians. It's the church, you know, are to know and to believe God's love. I like that, you know. And we have known, past tense, you know, have known and believed the love that God has for us. So, take notice, it's, he, he takes it beyond the state of simple belief. He takes it to knowing. We might see this as the relationship between belief and experience, or the connection between the objective or the subjective, or and the subjective. You know, the wonderful thing about the Christian life, the Christian position, is that it's both objective and subjective. It's both, you know, intellectual knowledge, but also experience. It's, it's something you live, something you walk out. It's something you, li you, you know, that's real and true. <sighs> but as fallen human beings as we are, we tend to gravitate to one side or the other. We tend to either really like the experience and kind of put the Bible away, or we really like the Bible and we're scared to death of the experience. And, and it's, it's so wrong. I know what it's like to get all wrapped up in theology and learning and in head knowledge. And you know, I know what that's like, and it becomes very intellectual. Many times we're not too concerned about the practice end of things putting it into practice. But, you know, anything that has never been applied to your life has never really been experienced. On the other hand, those who want the purely subjective Christian experience, the, the wows, the goosebumps, you know, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the feelings, the emotions, they don't really want to be hogtied to the Bible. They want to just go crazy out there and not have any limit or anything to, to direct them in their practice. And it's tragic to find ourselves in either of those camps because you are, what? Robbing yourself of the whole experience of the Christian life. The glory of the gospel, the Christian gospel, is that it deals with the whole person, the whole man, the whole woman. Not just your mind, not just your emotion, not just your heart, you know, or your will. It deals with all of it. And Paul in Romans 6, 17, he says this, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Notice the balance of that statement. You heard the doctrine, the truth. Your mind caught hold of something. 
and then you obeyed it it twisted your will but you obeyed from the heart from the depths of your character the depths of your being the the place of your emotional you know stability John is careful here he tells us the truth what we have seen what we have heard what we have handled what we have you know gone through and then asks us join in with us I know you haven't seen it but you will experience it I know you haven't handled but through our truth and through our revelation you can come into this fellowship this same exact fellowship that the apostles had with God the love of God can only be known and experienced completely through the person of Jesus Christ. John repeats that over and over, and that's what good teachers do. He just keeps going back to the same point. Well, why does he do that? Because we must learn to distrust any emotion that I have within myself with respect to God unless I can base it in the Word of God. Unless I can see it in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Him was manifested the love of God, John tells us. In Him was all this made real, was all this made true, was it all walked out. There is only one way to know God, and that is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know God's love? Look at Jesus. There is one mediator between man and God, the man, Christ Jesus. There is only, you know, every other method, every other um, way we might seek to come to know God is, is prone to deception, it's foolish and must be rejected. The way to come to know God is to pick up your New Testament, read those Gospels, come to know Jesus Christ, and then experience Him to the full. We must always remember that the objective and the subjective what you know and what you do or how it affects you, those two things always go hand in hand. You can never divide them. You can, you know, you come to this place of belief and you begin to love Jesus. You begin to love God because of what you see him do and what you've, you understand that he did for you. You begin to love others. It begins to grow in you. You, you even begin to love some of your enemies. You're praying for them, you know? Peter says it like this, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, or he becomes precious. He becomes, you know, your heart, your life, so knowledge and belief always must go hand in hand. There's a sense in which you cannot believe something unless you know it. And I totally get that. But from the experience side, you know, knowledge always follows belief. Here's what I'm trying to say. Someone had said it like this. A man's reach should always be greater than his grasp. It's, it's an interesting statement. A man's reach greater than his grasp. In New Testament terms, knowledge always follows faith, always follows your belief. Like a horse drawing a carriage, they're bound together. You cannot separate them, but the horse gets there first. Then comes the carriage. The horse of knowledge excuse me, the horse of faith always gets there before you really grasp it, before you really understand it, before you really take hold of it. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says it like this, Yet indeed I also count all things as loss for the excellence of the knowledge 
of Christ Jesus my Lord. Notice how he states that first. He's thanking God for this knowledge that he has. But then it, it goes on to say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death if by any means I may be conformed it, by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. We know certain things, and yet we want to know more. You know, knowledge follows faith and is always being led onwards by it. You might think of it like this. Knowledge is but a, sh a more sure grasp of faith or of what you've believed Knowledge is a state where I have truly grabbed hold of something. I understand it. I see it. I've got it. Oh, I got that now. In a sense, I have always possessed it, but I've never really grasped it until I know it. 1 John 4, 16, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us, are we thanking God for this? The Lord, oh, Lord, thank you for the faith I have to believe to you, for you to bring me to this place where I trust you, where I love you, where you're in my heart. Not just seeing it with your eyes of faith anymore, but actually living it, actually understanding it, actually bringing it in. Now I get it. Now I get what he's saying there. Now I see it. And yet there's so much more to know. Have you come to that place? I used to tell people, you know, when I was a baby believer, it was like looking at a golf ball. And I knew the outside of that golf ball. I knew where it said Wilson on it or Titleist, you know. And, you know, you'd look around and it's got all these dimples. And I knew all of that stuff. But what was inside, I didn't know. I knew there was still more to be known. And now, you know, 30 years down the road, it's more like a basketball. I know all the surface, all those little nubs and the little black lines and the place where you put the air in. And I, I know all of this stuff, more stuff, but there's more stuff inside that I still don't know. The love of God is so broad. It's so long. It's so deep. It is so high. My challenge is to go on and know it more, understand it deeper. Oh, I've experienced it. I, I know much about it, but it is called surpassing love. It's a love that surpasses knowledge. And otherwise, in other words, it goes into your brain, your brain collects some of it, but some of it goes right by you. Some of it, it it's bigger than your brain. It's bigger than what you can think. In Philippians chapter 3, it says, not that I have already attained. Anybody here? Not that I've already arrived, you know, or I'm already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. Oh, I want to forget those things that are behind, and I want to press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's an upward call. There's more to be had. There's, there's this future going on. I have, but I want more. I possess, but there's more to be possessed. Remember, John is writing to the people in the same world we live in. Man, they were undergoing persecution and trials and hardship and life and death and cancer and you know all of those things we do and yet it says John says man there's this fellowship with God and with his son Jesus Christ that you can come into and it will give you exceeding joy it will give you just this ability right here right now whatever you're going through to just persevere and get on through and do it actually with a smile on your face how is that possible in a world like this that we live in we must come to know 
and to believe in the love that God has towards us, towards you, the person in your seat. Paul says it like this in Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Do you know that love? Can, can you stand there and make that statement? And I'm persuaded that God's got me and nothing's going to get in the way. Nothing's going to interrupt that. You know, Paul, he even makes these statements and he makes them very personal. You remember Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see how he owned that statement? God loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> that is Paul's personal knowledge of what God has done for him. And he applies it to himself. Are you doing that? This is where we need to stand. We need to know what we believe, believe what we believe, and then, you know, apply it to ourselves. Peter says it kind of like this, in whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. See, the Christian doesn't just accept certain theoretical ideas of how God might love him. No, no. Oh, thank God, no. We experience God's love. It becomes our truth. It becomes our knowledge, our belief. So do we know this? Do you know that? You know, you can kind of test your knowledge. And I've written out a couple of questions just to hit you with. Maybe you'll have to go back to the video and see what the questions were again but number one am I ignoring God and this manifestation of love through Jesus Christ in my life well that that would be terrible to say yes to but it's a great question have I lost the sense that God is against me Because that's what I used to believe. God was that big bully with the big baseball bat and he was waiting around the corner just waiting for me to blow it so he could whack me, you know, whack a mole, you know, kind of thing. Have you lost your fear of judgment day? That, that day where you stay face to face with God. Oh, you still have awe. You still have godly fear, but you're not afraid anymore do you know or have a sense that God is for you that God loves you see this is a process you're walking through this thing do you have a sense that you have been forgiven you've been washed in the blood are you now filled with a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving to God as you sit there in your chair, are you thankful for everything that he's done? Has sin begun to bother you? <laughs> right? Have you even come to this place where you absolutely hate it? It drives me crazy because I look around the world and every awful thing that's going on is the result of sin. Every foul and loathsome thing, you know, even cancer, sickness, all of this stuff, sin. Do you want to please God with your life? Is it your goal to put a smile on his face at some time during the day? Do 
you want to know him more. More experience, more fellowship, more relationship, more love. Do you realize how poor our love is of him? He so loved us, and what do we give him back? <laughs> you know, our, our meager offerings. Are, are you really aware of that? Because that just rattles my cage sometimes. I got nothing to give back, Lord. <laughs> I got nothing. Just this, and that's terrible, you know? Do you delight in hearing about the Lord? Hearing about, you know, these things. So again, John's theme has been loving the brethren. And he's telling us, like in verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. He's told us that he who loves God is of God. You know, he's, he's pushing all of this stuff. You can test yourself. You can see yourself. Do you see yourself here? We've spoken of these things, but he wants us to come to a knowledge of them. Not just a belief, a knowledge. And we need to know that loving God and loving the brethren always go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. You can't say, I love God and I hate that guy. We're going to get there in this chapter or the next chapter. He's going to tell us that's an impossibility. But right now, you know, <clears throat> you remember when Jesus was asked, Master, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And you remember he said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the first. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two things cannot be divided. They're hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin. The other week we were talking about you know, my view of love like a cross. There's the vertical of the cross. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, you know. And then it's the, the cross beam, the horizontal, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he's summing up what he's been teaching us about this. You know, you can have no real assurance about God's love towards you unless you're living a life of love, a life you might say planted in love or founded in love. Love is the ultimate ground of assurance. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Our lives must be rooted like a mighty oak tree. Maybe you're just a little sapling right now. I get it. But like a mighty oak tree. Think about this idea. Here's love. Here's this you know, bed of love, and that tree is rooted in that bed. It's got a hold of the earth of that bed. And that bed isn't God's love for you. That bed is your love of God and your love of others. And you've been planted in that bed, and you need to take hold of that. All of your life, all of your nutrients, everything you need for this Christian life comes out of that bed into you and makes you this mighty tree. So you're rooted and then you're grounded in that bed. Foundation, like a building. You know, you need to dig down, get a hold of the rock, plant, you know, put this foundation so it's flat and stable and true. You know, it's the house that Jesus talked about at the end of Matthew chapter 7, 
You know, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. He dug down, made it clean, fastened itself down there. So when the wind and the waves come, it doesn't knock him around. How many Christians, how many of us, when the wind and the waves and the storms of life come, they knock us around? It's because you're not rooted and you're not grounded in this bed of love. It's then and only then that we will be able to comprehend or apprehend with all the saints what is the love of God. It's only as we plant ourselves and begin to grow in our little field of love that his immense how do, you, how do you say that? Because it's, it's the length, it's the width, or it's the length, it's the depth, it's the height. It's, it's this cube. Imagine measuring the cube of God's love. How long is it? Well, it started in eternity when he chose me. It's come into time and it's walked all the way through time and it's going to go back into eternity again and it's still perfect love. How about the depths? So he, he came from heaven and he humbled himself and took on flesh and came down and dwelt among us and went to the cross. Oh, the depths. Oh, the heights. Oh, he's about to take us from, from the pit of hell. Freak us from that kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of his love, into heaven and to sit on the very throne of God. Wait a minute. The heights. You, you begin to ponder that. The only way you're really going to ponder that is to plant your life in that box of love. This is where Christians get their life. It's just too hard. Get over yourself, you know? Get on with this. Because... God's love surpasses your brain. It does. It goes there, fills your brain up. It goes poof, and you get that purple puff, you know, like you see on the TV, and then it just keeps going. It's out there where faith walks. It is only as we stand here, having built our life upon that rock, having planted ourselves in that garden, that we, be, we will be able to weather the storms of life. Because the hardships and the cruelty and the, oh, the ugliness of this world will sweep you away unless you are founded, unless you are grounded, unless you are rooted. So do we dwell in love? John's word, do we abide in love? in love have we structured our new Christian lives in that foundation in that bed now, I got to tell you you can be a 30 year old Christian standing here going "Ooh, I've kind of missed that boat well start planting right start living there start digging for the foundation are we living and abiding in love. Listen to John again in 4.16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love. That's supposed to be you. That's supposed to be me. This is the Christian. He who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this. This is how love's perfected. That we might have boldness in the day of judgment. We might be able to stand there on judgment day, a big smile on our face, going, man, I love some people that were unlovable. I put up with some people that was crazy. Why did I do that? Because God put up with me all of those times, you know? 
Because as he is, so are we in this world. We are to be abiding in love. Abide means to settle down and be at home there. To live there day to day. There's no argument here. John doesn't, you know, build up some kind of argument. He just states categorically, Christians are those who abide in love. And if you're not abiding in love, there's a big question going back the other way. Are you then a Christian? They live in an atmosphere of love. Their lives are controlled by love. Ooh. This is the great difference between a believer and an unbeliever. You know, listen to Paul as he, as he um, describes an unbeliever to you. In Titus 3.3 3 it says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the opposite of where we're planted now. But the Christian, he's this brand new man. He's got a brand new nature. He's been planted in God's garden. He has a very different spirit now within him. And that life needs to be rooted and grounded in love. We've become a partaker of the divine nature. God's very nature. Now, somehow inside of us, living a life of love with respect to God, I should love the Lord thy God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength, and with respect to others, your neighbors, your friends, even those who hate you, persecute you. This might be, in one way, you might look at it like this, this is the ultimate objective of your salvation. God is forming a people, a, a group of humanity, into a group of people who will love others the way he loves others. Hmm. Notice what he says in this last statement in verse 17. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Christians are people who dwell in love. That means, says John, they are like God. They are like the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine us Christians right here in Rexburg, Idaho with all its issues, with all its sin, with all its troubles. Just the same as Christ is now in heaven, you are now on earth. You read the Gospels and Christ was always having compassion on those people he came around. Oh, this one's sick. Oh, this one's missing a leg. Oh, this one's got leprosy. Oh, this one's an idiot. That was me, by the way, you know. And yet he had compassion. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all of those things, all things, the, the, the brand new things, are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us that word, that ministry of reconciliation. That ministry of reconciliation is love. Christ's ministry has been given to you. Oh, he's not here anymore. You remember? Oh, he, he went back, but he left you and he left me. Not imputing their trespasses to them. Oh, are we guilty of that? 
We're standing in Christ's stead. We're his ambassadors. He sent us out with a message. We're the called, and yet we look at the people and go, that guy was a jerk last time. I'm not going to go talk to him. That guy smells funny when you get close to him. and I, I don't want to be over there. Love looked beyond the offenses. Now think about that. Christ, the religious leaders trying to plot and connive and twist and, you know, trip him up. The spitting, the mocking, the reviling, and the cross. That is a very high calling that you have and that I have. Our attitudes towards people can no longer be determined by what they are or what they have done to us. Period. Let's walk that out for a day. Our attitude can no longer be determined by them. Our attitude, our life must now be controlled by love. It's the bed we live in. It's the nourishment we bring in. It's what grows us and gives us life. It's our foundation. It's our footing. It's where we stand. It's where we build our lives. Why did God send his only son for you? Was it because we deserved it? I know I did. I don't know about you guys. What a, what a ridiculous thing to say, right? No. No. God's love was not controlled by me. No. It was nothing but God's self-generating love that brought salvation to me and to you. One of the greatest characteristics of God's love was that it never considered itself Rather, it considered you. It didn't say, <laughs> look at that fool. Look at all the junk he's done. Look at the evil he's causing. Look at how he goes around all that stuff, you know? Sin and ungodliness. He doesn't care for anybody else. No, 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 no. It never said that. The love of God is shown in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Philippians 2, you guys all know this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That means our attitude, the way we treat others, must not be determined or controlled by the other. It must be determined and controlled by love. Stop putting yourself in between God's love and this guy. Yeah, but he treated me wrong. Get out of the way. God so loved the world, those guys you don't like, those guys that ooh, frustrate you, God so loved them that he sent Jesus. We have no right to stand in the way of Jesus. Matter of fact, we're supposed to be standing for Jesus in this way. We're supposed to view them as God does. That's a lost soul. That's a victim of sin. That's one that has been taken by the fall, Genesis chapter 3, and ruined, trampled over. He's blind. 
she's captive. They're dead in trespasses and sins. How do you treat blind people? I just ask you. You know, you're driving down the road and you see this person up ahead and they're walking along and they step right out in front of your car. Well, that jerk should have known better than to step out in front of my car. Blaring horn and screeching tires and, you know, showing him my IQ out the window and yelling stuff. Or did you take the time to notice that that guy's blind? Did you see that cane he was holding? A red patch around the bottom of that white cane? You see him walking like this? You see him carefully doing so many things? When you notice, when you know that that person's lost, when you know they're blind, when you know they can't help it, but be a jerk like you used to be, remember? The idea of forgiving a few bumps, you know, he walks along and he bumps you. He didn't see you there. He knocks, he makes a big mess, you know? Well, when God moves in here, he makes us ready to forgive and overlook all of this trivial stuff because that is a lost soul and that is the most valuable thing on the planet if it would but just see Christ. We have an eye on eternity and we have an eye on the Lord and we have an eye remembering who we used to be and where God brought us from and suddenly, we're ready to cover over all of that stuff with love. Let this mind be in you. We are like that because he is in us. So if we are truly his in this world, we must be ready to come down and humble ourselves just like he did to be misunderstood, to be laughed at, to be mocked, to be mistreated, to be scorned, and yes, if necessary, to die. Anything that might reveal Christ's love for that guy. Matthew chapter five, Sermon on the Mount, you know, the New Testament law, if you will. <laughs> For if you love those who love you, what reward is that? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Don't the worst among you do that? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? This is normal. Everybody pretty much lives that kind of life. If you're good to me, I'm good to you. And if you smile at me, I'll smile at you. And we can get along. But I say to you, and this is your Lord speaking, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you or misuse you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Do you see how God does it? God's just going to be good to everybody. God's just going to bless everyone with the basics. That's where we need to be, right? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh, did you catch that? We're to love as the Father has loved. The Father loved by sending His only Son. Sending the deepest part of himself to be crucified and lost and spit on and abused. You want to be like that? Send the deepest part of yourself to the one that hates you, to the enemy. Hmm. 
Jesus isn't here. You're here. You're here in his place. So go ahead in his stead and go out into this world and be like him. Show forth his love. Show forth, you know, his compassion. When you see somebody and they need help and they need love and they need whatever, compassion is love driven to do. You know, Paul says, I'm compelled by the love of Christ. That's what compels me. That's what drives me. That's what gets me out and goes. Be compelled by God's love for somebody else. As he is, so are we in the world. And notice, he says, we need to dwell or we need to abide in this love. In other words, it can't be spasmatic. It can't be, oh, that's pretty good yesterday, so I can be a jerk today, you know, kind of a thing. <sighs> what if God were spasmatic in his love towards you? <laughs> it caught me on a bad day. Sorry, buddy. You know? Oh, I, I, I heard what you said around the corner, and now you're coming and praying to me, and, well, thanks anyway, but I'm not interested. To abide implies stable, unchanging. We all know Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging. You remember the fathers talked about the same way in James chapter 1. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, no hint of God ever changing there. So again, we must realize God's love by looking at ourselves. What we are, our deep and desperate need. Sometimes we have to be made worse before we can be made better. We were hopeless hopeless and helpless without Christ. We were condemned sinners on the highway to hell, and deservingly so. You could never fix that. You could never change that. You couldn't make yourself right before God. And it's in that truth that we discover the depths of God's love for us. It's infinite and it's everlasting. It's longer than anything and more steady than anything we can ever understand. His only begotten son into this cruel world to save this worthless life on that awful cross. And it's at the end of self. It's at that place where you see where you were or where you are that you truly see God's love for you. And we have to dwell there. We need to abide there. <laughs> In that knowledge in that understanding, in that belief. We have to think about it. We have to remind ourselves of it. Our condition, God's great love. And what our position is now as his sons and daughters. Oh, we're God's son now. We're God's daughter down here on planet Earth. And he wants you to walk in his son's steps. Not spasmatically thinking about this, but constantly thinking, having your mind going over this stuff. You want to avoid that depressing place? Who doesn't, right? Oh, I don't want to drag myself back to what I used to be and who I used to be. And I'm well beyond that now. I, I, don't, I don't want to go back down there. Sorry. Sorry to ruin your little parade where you are the most effective 
is where you are the most defective. <sighs> it's when you really know there's nothing in you that's good. Remember Paul saying that? There's nothing in this flesh, nothing in here that's worth a darn. I'm the chief of sinners. That wasn't hyperboil. He wasn't blowing stuff up and just, oh, look at how amazing I can write. No, no, no. I must constantly be dragging my worthless hide down to the very depths of the cross, to the foot of the cross, and saying, God, I am nothing, but in your hands I can do all things. Everything that comes up in life, if I see it from the foot of that cross, totally changes everything I do. Because I have to look up at everything from the foot of that cross. I have to look up to the drunk laying in the street. I have to look up to the guy cutting me off on hit road. I have to look up from there. My trouble is, I don't stay there. Paul says, or John says, maybe you should try stay in there. Maybe you should try stay in there because then it's easy to love people from there because they can't hurt you. They can't say anything bad about you that you don't already know is true. I cannot avoid this. I must not avoid this. No matter how much I don't like it, it makes me feel all yucky. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm not worthy or not righteous. Well, you're not. Get over yourself, you know? What are you? I'm a lost sinner on my way to hell until Christ grabbed hold of me, transformed me. What if Christ treated me the way I just treated that guy? <laughs> what if Christ, you know, treated my situation the way I just treated that situation. What would have happened to me? Where would I be? My whole life must begin to be controlled by love. Period. What do you believe about God's love? What do you know about the width of it, the length of it, the depth of it, the height of it? We must start to live there. And then go through in our faith to reach deeper and deeper. You know, you, you see these pictures of these little kids, you know, they're a six-month-old, an eight-month-old baby on the beach, and they're they're letting they're they're putting their feet in the water and it's splashing and they're, oh, but if that ocean was God's love, oh, they can see the vastness of it and they're, they're playing in the little field. You know, we, we need to get out there. If this thing's the Pacific Ocean, there's a, there's a ton out there and so maybe you've, now you've got a rowboat, you know? Maybe you're out there in it and you're like, oh, wonder how deep it is here. Well, just go ahead, dive off, see how, see how deep it is. Well, what if I... What if I understand it all, really? We've been on planet Earth for a few thousand years now and we have yet to figure out what's in the Pacific Ocean. Isn't it funny? The depth is beyond, it surpasses knowledge, but it's still out there, we know it. How long is it, how deep is it, how wide is it? How high is it? We must begin to discipline ourselves. I know that's a bad word. You know, Paul says we must buffet. And a lot of us misread that word as buffet. You know, <laughs> we must buffet ourselves. It's not buffet, it's buffet. You know, we've got to discipline ourselves, begin to take our thoughts captive unto the obedience of Christ. Yeah, it's a big job. But God is the one who called you to it. And he doesn't call you to do something unless he gives you the ability to do it. He gives you the strength. He'll give you the ability. He gives you the access to himself. And yes, we must grow in it, right? Come from that little kid just splashing around in the love of God 
to getting out there and getting, you know, a wave over the head or out there surfing or out there in a big boat seeing or down in a submarine seeing or, you know, we got to grow in this thing. And then continually to actively let love control, let love govern us. Not the situation, not the person, not the encounter, not the circumstance. Love must control us. Hmm. So I challenge you this week, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. There's this uh, prayer of Paul's that I've been kicking through for about two months now, maybe three. It says, Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and here's his prayer, that he would grant you, notice this is something freely given, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, how rich is his glory, hmm. to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You might think about that, the inner man, your mind, your heart, your will, and to be strengthened has this idea of being reinforced, that he might put the rebar and the concrete in to my mind, to my will, you know, to my heart. You know, my mind is weak. I need that to be strengthened. My heart is weak. I need it to be able to hold more of Christ so I see other people in the right light. My will needs to be set and then established, firmed up, you know? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Notice your heart must be reinforced before he can dwell in there. He's talking to Christians. They've received the Spirit of God. You can't be a Christian and not receive the Spirit of God. But he's saying, man, there's more available. There's deeper. There's higher. You know, and it's going to need some superstructure in there to hold what I'm about to lay on you here. So he says that Christ may dwell in your heart, and I like to put richly through faith right there, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend or maybe apprehend with all the saints, what is the length, the width, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. And then this last line, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, you want to be filled with all the fullness of God? You need some rebar in your life. You need some concrete. You need some structure. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What power is that? To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I challenge you to read that, to underline that, maybe to memorize that and to walk through that point by point by point and pray it for yourself. This is the selfish prayer. And then you'll begin to pray it for others. But it's the selfish prayer because I need strengthened. You know, that God would grant me to be strengthened in the inner man. You going through something tough? You don't need strength on the outside. You need strength on the inside. You're going through physical problem? You don't need strength on the outside. I mean, healing would be great, but what you really need is to know what you know and to stand where you stand and be grounded, be firmly established so that thing doesn't knock you off your foundation. Be rooted in that. 
Like I said, I, I've been dealing with this prayer for months. I'm not through with it yet. It's still talking to me. It's still growing in me. But it's powerful because Paul says, this is what you need as a growing Christian. Plant yourself in that box of love. And from there, you'll be able to begin to comprehend or apprehend the length, width, height, depth, to know the love of Christ, which passes this old knocking of yours. To be filled with the fullness of Christ and to be filled with all the fullness of God. I mean, what would that even be like? And yet, Paul says, this is available. Are you ready to walk? Are you ready to plant yourself there? Are you ready to live a life controlled? Just controlled by love. Oh. Father, as we think about, you know, just wrapping up this thing on brotherly love and its assurance for us and its depths where we can get it, where we find it, how we live that life. Lord, would we just take a moment and say, Lord, I want to be a man or a woman of God that loves, that chooses to love. God, that's going to take a lot of work because you know me. But God, you are the one who does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So God, come, pour out your spirit on me. Bring that reinforcement and begin to apply it in my life. Get that superstructure together that I might be able to hold Christ. Be filled with all the fullness of God. And let me do that not just for myself, but let me do that that I might walk out what you walked out and love others and draw others to you. Oh, Father, the high and holy calling, and I'm anything but high and holy, and yet you're the one that chose us, you're the one that brought us, and you're the one that makes all things possible. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.